Good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Rebecca Borowski, and I'm a doctoral candidate at Indiana University in Bloomington. As a member of the local organizing committee for this year's conference, it is my pleasure to introduce today's plenary speaker. This individual taught middle school math for 14 years and has been teaching at the university level since 2000. She currently serves as professor of mathematics education in the Department of Middle and Secondary Education at the University of Louisville. Her research investigates the professional development of teachers of mathematics, particularly focusing on mathematics coaching. She served as chair of the task force for the joint position statement on the role of elementary mathematics specialists in the teaching and learning of mathematics. This position statement was particularly meaningful in my own career as it helped support the argument for continued funding of mathematics coaches in the school district in North Carolina where I was teaching at the time it was released. This person's service and leadership, particularly within NCTM and in AMTE, has had impact that has been felt across the mathematics education community just as I felt it in my own classroom back in 2010. She has contributed to a number of publications on math coaches and elementary math specialists, most recently having co-edited a book on elementary math specialists published just this year. Perhaps most importantly, this person continues to work directly with coaches, teacher leaders, and administrators. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Maggie Magatha for her talk, Elementary Math Specialists, Ensuring the Intersection of Research and Practice. After her talk, Dr. Magatha will do join Dr. Dion Cross of Indiana University Bloomington and Jane Mahan, lead district coach for Evansville Vanderburg School Corporation for a discussion panel. This panel will be facilitated by HAMT president, Dr. Cheryl Stump of Ball State University. Thank you. Dr. Magatha. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm very honored to be um, with you today to talk about elementary math specialist. So I'll give you a little outline of where we're going in the talk today. We're going to start with a little historical background, and then we'll look at what's happening in the field in terms of practice. Then we'll take a look at what's happening in the field in terms of research. Then we'll talk a little bit about how can we ensure the intersection of research and practice. And then we'll go to the panel discussion. So I want to point out that the work that I share in, am sharing today builds upon um, some of my most recent work. In 2015, the NCTM research brief on mathematics coaches provided an overview of the research. And then this year, as Rebecca said, um, AMTE came out with the second book in their professional book series that I co-edited with my dear friend and colleague, Nicole Riggleman. Wave your hand, Nicole. So, um, but also, more importantly, um, the work that I'm going to share today is not my work. The work that I'm going to share today is our work. It's the work of a collective group of researchers trying to focus on um, elementary math specialists, researchers and practitioners. So this is a, a collective group um, that I'm going to share their work. So I'm going to start with um, a brief historical overview. And this is a shortened version of what's actually in the paper. So this is a brief overview. In 1981, NCTM Board of Directors recommended that state certification agencies offer some sort of teaching credentials for math teaching for elementary math specialists. That was 1981. That was 36 years ago that we began talking about this. So in 1989, the National Research Council in Everybody Counts recommended that states alter certification requirements to encourage and use elementary math specialists um, in elementary schools. And then, in adding it up, in 2001, they recommended that math specialists should be in every single elementary school in the country. 
In 2000, NCTM released the Principles and Standards for School Mathematics. This document discussed the importance of mathematics teacher leaders and specialists, especially focusing on grades three to five. In 2001, the Conference Board of Mathematical Sciences in the Mathematical Education of Teachers called for mathematics specialists starting at the fifth grade. And then in 2012, with the second document, they outlined the increased use of elementary math specialists. So at this point, we'd made some progress. And in the second document, they're saying, hey, there's a little bit more of this going on. In 2003, NCTM and NCATE, which is the National Council for Accreditation of Teacher Education, released the standards for elementary math specialist programs. In 2012, NCTM and now CAPE released a set of standards for elementary math specialist and advanced preparation. In 2008, the, Mathemat the National Mathematics Advisory Panel released their report and in which they called for research to be conducted on the use of math specialists in elementary schools. The main reason they called for that particular statement is when the math panel was trying to find research to put into this document, they couldn't find any. So in 2009, NCTM released the first research brief on math coaching. In that research brief, nine studies were included. Only nine. Then in 2015, that research brief was updated. That research brief included 24 studies. So some increase, but still, when you think about a body of research, uh, that's not a lot. In 2010, AMTE released the Standards for Elementary Math Specialists, which outlined program standards for teacher credentialing and degree programs. So this was mainly focused for state boards of education and institutions of higher ed who were trying to create programs. That document was revised in 2013. And then earlier this year, as Rebecca just said, AMTE released their second book in their professional book series that Nicole and I had the pleasure of editing called Elementary Math Specialists Developing, Refining, and Examining Programs that Support Mathematics Teaching and Learning. Here's the book. And after the panel discussion, we're giving a copy of this away. So although if you went and looked at each of these recommendations and the other ones that are listed in the paper, they almost all use the term mathematics specialist. But when you dig in and read each of their recommendations, they actually describe models that include working with students, working with teachers, and in some cases, both. So there's lots of confusion around who really is an elementary math specialist. The title can vary from state to state. It can vary from district to district. Um, it can even vary from schools within a district. So there's a lot of confusion around all of these different titles. So um, my colleague Nicole and I, in an effort to try to provide some clarity on these titles in the AMTE book, which was released earlier this year, we offered a general overview of the work in which these teacher leaders engage and suggested some common language that could be used in referring to these positions. So you'll see at the top, we start with an umbrella um, role just called a math specialist. And then we divide that into elementary and secondary. So while today's talk is going to focus on elementary math specialists, um, there is a, a group of people that is beginning to grow larger who are advocating for secondary math specialists. Uh, my colleague John Ray says we need coaches more in high school than we do elementary school. So he's one of the people um, that is leading that charge. 
So we're going to talk today just about elementary math specialists, though. And you'll see underneath there, we break that down into three different roles. The first one is an elementary mathematics teacher. So this is someone who teaches all of the mathematics in like the fourth grade or the fifth grade. So we sometimes call that a departmentalized model. It's not exactly departmentalized, um, but it's someone who is specializing in the teaching of mathematics, and so they teach all of the math classes for that grade level. So this is someone who works with students all day long. Next, we have the elementary mathematics intervention specialist. This person also typically works with students most of the day, but they work specifically on intervention. So they may be part of an intervention program that's maybe a pull-out program or a push-in program. Um, so they work with students in those specific settings. And the third category is the mathematics coach. A mathematics coach typically works with adults all day long. So they work with teachers. So the main distinction that we sought to make was those who work with students and those who work with teachers. So regardless of the title that you use to describe these leaders, the mathematics education community has recognized a need for these people, whatever you call them, for over 35 years. Over 35 years we've been talking about this, yet we haven't made a lot of progress. And so that needs to change. So let's transition now and talk about all of these calls that have come out in the last 36 years and what kind of action that has prompted in the field. So let's look at the practice. What is happening in the field? So again, a little bit of a historical perspective here. In 1988, ExxonMobil launched the K-5 Mathematics Specialist Program in which grants were given to 120 districts across the country to train and place mathematics specialists in elementary schools. The state of Virginia took advantage of the Exxon Mobil grants and they became an early leader in supporting the work of elementary math specialists. Various stakeholders and organizations in that state began work as early as 1992 and I'm really happy to say that work is continuing today in Virginia. Virginia is one of the leaders in the United States in supporting the work of elementary math specialists. There are several people here in the room from Virginia. Raise your hand, Virginia people. Thank you for the work you're doing. So the Elementary Math Specialist and Teacher Leader Project was supported by the Mathematics Institute of Wisconsin, and it was created in 2009 to support a core group of elementary math specialists in Maryland. This project hosts a clearinghouse. If you haven't seen it, you should check out their website. There's lots of resources there for, resor for researchers and practitioners. The Mathematics Coaching Program, which is in its 12th year, was designed as a training program for experienced teachers who work with uh, full-time mathematics coaches in Ohio. They team with teachers in six-week um, sessions and they work in their classroom together um, to help them think about implementing research-based strategies. The Examining Mathematics Coaching Program was a five-year NSF-funded study that ended in 2014. This study investigated the types and depths of knowledge needed by effective instructional coaches. These are five. There are many, many more projects and programs going on across the country. Many people in this room are involved in those. So right now, if you are involved in a research project or some sort of program that supports elementary math specialists? Would you just raise your hand? Thank you. We need to, absolutely, give them a round of applause. This is work that needs to grow. 
And when we look at the research, uh, that will tell you why it needs to grow. It's important work. Another important aspect of the work in the field focuses on the ongoing support of the three professional organizations in mathematics, the Association of Mathematics Teacher Educators, the National Council of Supervisors of Mathematics, and the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. Each of these organizations are engaged in various ways in supporting the work of elementary math specialists, such as they have journals that are either focused on or have articles uh, focused on elementary math specialists. They have learning opportunities of many varieties, such as conferences, webinars, professional development. They have resources for elementary math specialists. So in particular, the National Council of Supervisors of Mathematics has a coaching corner on their website that is exclusively for people who are working as math coaches and specialists. And they have scholarships and grants. In particular, AMTE has an EMS scholarship, which they award two or three a year, and this is for people who are working on getting an endorsement, and so it will help them pay for coursework. Uh, so important ways that they need to be supported. This is just a very short list. The paper has a much longer list of the many ways that these organizations are supporting the work of elementary math specialists. And now we can add to the list PMENA. Very excited about that. So now let's transition to what's happening in the field in terms of the research. Let me begin by defining the research that I will share today. This is not all the research that has been done on elementary math specialists. It is published research studies from 2001 to the present, or it's research papers or presentations from 2001 to the present. It does not include research that is done in doctoral dissertations. Not because that's not important work, it certainly is. It doesn't include research that's done in evaluation reports. Again, not because it's not important work, it certainly is. When we began to work on this, we had to find a way to um, reduce the work so that we could talk about it in a way that makes sense. So this was the criteria that was selected for the research brief when we were deciding to put that work together. This isn't all the work, there's much more work out there. This is an overview. There are two major areas that are discussed in the research, and they're the two areas that are highlighted. First is the elementary math teacher, so there is some research focused on those specialists who work in the classroom with, with students. And then the second area is those who work with teachers as coaches. And we'll briefly look at the research in each of these areas. Let's begin with the elementary mathematics teacher model. There are actually very few studies on specialists as mathematics teachers. There's a few research findings. Working as a math teacher specializing in mathematics allowed teachers to focus their planning and professional development. Teachers in these positions reported gains in student achievement. Student achievement was greater in schools with math teachers as compared to schools without specialized math teachers. Teachers believed it supported them in providing higher quality instruction and was beneficial to students. Scheduling issues in isolation was problematic in some cases. Teachers changed their practice to be more inquiry-based, but this took time. This is something that's really important in this research and the research I'll share in a minute about coaches. This work takes time, and we have to be able to share that with all of the stakeholders involved. This takes time. 
Recently, there have been two large NSF projects, one in Washington State and one in Missouri, focused on this model. Um, I have talked with some colleagues here at this conference who are right now conceptualizing research projects on this model. So stay tuned. There's more to come on this model, and we need much more research on this model. So now let's look at the research that focuses on mathematics coaches. This is where most of the research is. The research in this category falls into three broad distinctions. How do coaches interact with teachers? What knowledge do coaches need? And what is the impact of mathematics coaching? So we're going to begin with how do coaches interact with teachers? The answer to this question really varies greatly because districts and schools are still trying to figure out the answer to this. Um, we're trying different things. People don't know what works yet. Um, several studies have focused on this question in order to support schools and really trying to understand the most beneficial coaching practices. The, this research in this area focuses, breaks down into two pieces. One is focused on one-on-one -on -one interactions, so that might be a coach and a teacher, and then it focuses on group interactions, so a coach working with a PLC or a group of teachers. So let's begin with the one-on-one -on -one settings. Studies that reported on coaching in one-on-one -on -one settings, in general, have identified similar ways of interacting with teachers that fell along a continuum from more directive to less directive. While each of the studies used different language to describe the ways of interacting, they all focused on similar ideas. So on the more directive end of the continuum, the coach shared knowledge by modeling lessons, telling teachers what to do, providing resources. Towards the middle of the continuum, coaching interactions focused on co-teaching, co-planning, providing support during teaching. And on the less directive end of the continuum, the coach supported teachers in becoming reflective practitioners. Activities on this end of the continuum included collecting data from observed lessons, providing feedback, engaging teachers in thoughtful reflections. While all of these coaching interactions serve useful purposes, activities on the less directive end of the continuum seem to be more powerful in supporting teachers in changing their instructional practice. So a second aspect of coaching is coaching interaction are those group interactions, such as a coach working with a grade level team or working with PLCs. So Gibbons and Cobb identified potential group coaching practices from the research on professional development and teacher learning that included doing mathematics, analyzing student work, analyzing classroom video, and rehearsing high leverage teaching practices. Now they're very quick to point out that all of this research came from the generic professional development research. And so they're putting it forth as something for us to consider in mathematics coaching. Are these the things that are going to be productive in mathematics coaching? And so it's an area of research that we need um, to engage in. So some of my colleagues in the room, Baker, Bailey, Larson, and Galanti, right down here at this table, raise your hands, ladies. Three of the four are here. Um, they took this framework and they actually applied it to the mathematics coaching research that was out there to try to identify the high leverage coaching practices that were being studied. Um, they and other people in this room are continuing that work, and it's going to be really important work 
for us to be able to say to the community, here are the high leverage practices. So NCTM just came out with the effective teaching practices. What we need to come out with are the effective coaching practices. So we have some people in the room working on that. Another really needed area of research. A few studies have focused on group coaching interactions, and here's what we know from these studies. It is important to hold regularly scheduled meetings in order to build community and maintain momentum. That's one of those findings that's kind of like, duh. But if it's a finding in the research, that means it wasn't happening. So it's important. Focus group meetings on issues of practice, such as student learning and best teaching practices. Beyond regularly scheduled meetings, Gibbon reported on the use of math labs, which are similar to lesson study, as a coaching structure to support the collective learning of a group of teachers. All right, so that's how do coaches interact with teachers. Now we're ready for what knowledge do coaches need? Well, as I mentioned earlier, AMTE released the standards for elementary math specialists in 2010 and updated again in 2013. This document offered detailed descriptions of these three broad areas of knowledge necessary for math coaches and specialists. Content knowledge for teaching mathematics, pedagogical content knowledge for teaching mathematics, and leadership knowledge and skills. This document is available for free download on the AMTE website if you do not have a copy. Researchers generally agree that these three areas are, of knowledge are important. However, the research in this category focuses more explicitly on that third category of leadership knowledge and skills. So Sutton, Burroughs, and Yap outlined eight domains of mathematics coaching knowledge. You can see those on the screen. At first glance, many of these domains seemed aligned to the AMTE categories we just showed, those first two about the content and pedagogical knowledge. But when you actually read their study and read about each of these, these are really focused on supporting teachers in doing these things. So it really falls under the leadership. It's about how do I support teachers in each of these areas. Several research studies help us to further define the knowledge that coaches need to support teachers. For example, it's important for coaches to understand trajectories of teachers' development so they can offer differentiated experiences for teachers. You know, we tell teachers all of the time, we have PD on how to differentiate your instruction. Sometimes when we start working with adults, we kind of forget that, right? Adults need differentiated professional development as well. It's also important to create long-term goals for teachers' development. Setting goals in coaching is something we don't do enough of either. It's important. Coaches should have a deep knowledge of instructional practice and theory so they can support teachers in doing the following, assessing their own practice, making connections between theory and practice, which is one of the themes of this conference. It's important for coaches, excuse me, it's important for teachers to be able to assess their own practice. It's not really the job of the coach to assess or evaluate the teacher's practice. The job of the coach is to support the teacher in learning how to do that as a self-directed learner. Campbell and Malchus reiterated the importance of adequate preparation for coaches to make sure they possess the knowledge necessary to be effective coaches. All right, we're now ready for what is the impact of math coaching? So we've looked at how they interact with teachers. We've looked at the knowledge. Now the question everybody wants to know, does coaching make a difference? 
So when looking at this part of the research, there are two major areas that are discussed here, improving teacher instructional practice and improving student achievement. Teacher instructional practice is defined very broadly across these studies. Um, relative to how it's described in the NCTM standards, the effective teaching practices, so very broad descriptions. Of course, each study reports on particular aspects of teacher instructional practice that was their focus. So across all of the studies that focused on instructional practice, practice of teachers, researchers saw improvements in varying degrees in teacher instructional practice, including increases in questioning skills, student engagement, teaching for understanding. Increases were also noted in particular instructional formats, such as cooperative learning, classroom discourse, and technology. So now let's turn to the seven studies that looked at the impact on student achievement. There were seven studies and in varying degrees and with a variety of research methods, all the studies reported increases in some way in student achievement. At the elementary and middle school levels, studies showed that coaching positively impacted student achievement on state level assessments during the first and second years of a coaching program. Additional studies at the elementary and middle school levels focused on student achievement impact after four years of a coaching program, and this showed even stronger results. Findings from these longer studies indicate that in order to significantly impact student achievement, coaches need both experience and sufficient time to interact with teachers. This particular research finding is really important to share with our K-12 partners, and especially, I believe, administrators. Many times administrators will decide they want coaches, they pick out someone to be the math coach, they coach for a year, they get their test scores and say, yeah, that coaching stuff's not really working. But we have research to say that they have to be adequately prepared and it takes time. Administrators need to know that. Um, by the way, if you're trying to advocate with K-12 people, the NCTM research brief is a free download. It's very short, written in very friendly language, and it's a quick read, and it's a great advocacy tool to talk to people about why we need coaches. All right, let's turn now to focusing on ensuring the intersection of practice and research. As we move forward in the field, it's imperative that we keep this in mind. These roads have got to merge, they can't diverge. So let's look at that. I believe that probably the most important way to ensure the intersection of EMS practice and research is collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. We must emphasize the importance of ongoing research to identify best practices in the field that are making a difference. We really cannot describe research-based practices in coaching right now because there hasn't been enough research, and we need to change that. So I propose four suggestions in the paper to support us in ensuring the intersection of practice and research. I'll briefly talk about each of these. First, identify districts using elementary math specialists. We really do not know the number of districts using elementary math specialists because a comprehensive national survey has not been completed. Somebody needs to do that work. Sounds like a good thing for a doctoral student to me. Somebody needs to do this work. We don't know how many people out there 
are actually involved in this work. Once we know where programs exist, we can encourage districts to share their successes and challenges to support other elementary math specialists through conference presentation and practitioner journal articles. In addition, for those of us in the research world, we can form partnerships with districts to support them in conducting research on elementary math specialist programs to further inform the field. Second, provide adequate preparation and ongoing support for elementary math specialists. As noted throughout this talk and in the paper, there are many initiatives focused on supporting elementary math specialists in the field. These efforts need to continue and new efforts need to emerge. There is an abundance of anecdotal evidence of districts who use coaches and provide them no training. Many times, if you're a good math teacher, you're plucked out of the classroom to be a good coach. By the way, there's no, um, no correlation there that if you're a good math teacher, it means you're gonna be a good coach. And then you're told to go coach and you're not given any training. Um, I, I do presentations and professional development all the time with coaches who say, I don't know how to coach. Nobody taught me how to coach. I was just told to do the job. So we know from research, from Pat Campbell and other research, that adequate preparation is imperative if we want to improve student achievement. Adequate preparation, ongoing support is critical. Third, increase the number of states with elementary math specialist certifications and endorsements. So here's the current map of the states that have an EMS certification or endorsement. There are 20 states, that's the states in blue, that offer an EMS certification or endorsement. As the number of states offering an EMS credential increases, of course we're gonna see more EMS in the field and, and we'll have more opportunities to support the teaching and learning of mathematics. Receiving a credential should require some level of preparation, which aligns with suggestion number two. And of course, the more well-prepared elementary math specialist in the field will increase the research opportunities. And a shout out to Nicole for making this map for me. <laughs> Here's the list in case you couldn't see them um, on the map. These are the 20 states that currently have elementary math specialist endorsements or credentials of some sort. And then you'll see there has some states in yellow and green. Those states are in progress and working towards that. So I'd like to pause just a minute here and give a shout out to all the gray states up there. These are the states that don't currently have some sort of EMS certification. But there are several examples from those gray states of incredible ways that they are finding to support EMS in the field, even without a certification. Indiana is one of the best examples of this. Indiana has been trying for several years to convince the powers that be that the state needs an EMS certification or endorsement. Sadly, they have not been able to convince those people. But the most inspiring part of that story is they have not stopped working to support elementary math specialists in this state. There's a group of dedicated professionals that are working on this. They have a conference every year for elementary math specialists. They engage in a variety of other activities to support elementary mathematics specialists. If you're one of those leaders from Indiana, raise your hand. Thank you. There are other states that are doing this as well. Alabama and Mississippi are both examples of states who don't have this endorsement, yet they have a similar group of dedicated people who are doing everything they can to support the work of elementary math specialists in their state because they understand the research and they understand how this can support student achievement. 
So kudos to all of you who don't have an EMS certification, but you're still finding ways to do the work. And fourth, establish working groups focused on EMS research. There are relatively few researchers focused on EMS. Most of them are in the room today. <laughs> They need, we need opportunities to collaborate with other like-minded researchers to reflect on our practice and to explore future research opportunities. I'm thrilled to say that at this conference, we have a working group that has been focused on math teacher leaders and what the research around that group needs to look like. Um, if you've been involved, in the math teacher leader working group here at this conference. Raise your hand. Woo woo. All right. So a few such groups um, have emerged outside of this conference, but we need much more attention to focusing the elementary math specialist research agenda. Relatedly, two EMS research conferences have occurred recently. In 2015, AMTE sponsored one, 2016, the Virginia Mathematics Specialist Initiative sponsored one. Such conferences are another opportunity for researchers to share their work and form collaborations. Because currently it's a small group of researchers, these conferences are not that expensive, and there's funding out there to help fund them. So we need more opportunities for elementary math specialist researchers and secondary math specialist researchers to come together um, to collaborate and provide more insights and research for the field. So, in closing, it's really exciting to be involved in an area of practice and research that is still emerging and growing. We have opportunities to influence the field in multiple ways. We also still have many challenges facing us. As we continue to find ways to ensure the intersection of practice and research, we will move the field forward in very positive ways. Thank you very much. I am so honored to be able to ask questions of the people here at this table. Um, first, could you introduce yourselves, Maggie, reintroduce yourself, and tell a little bit about your role in the world of mathematics specialists or teacher leadership? So I'm Maggie McGatha from the <laughs> University of Louisville, and um, I've been really involved in um, thinking about the research around mathematics um, specialist, um, and also work a lot with coaches. So I work, um, I, I kind of straddle the research and practice. Um, I work in both of those worlds. Dion Cross Francis, I'm at Indiana University Bloomington, and I kind of tripped and fell into the work of um, supporting coaches a few years ago I was writing a grant um, to submit to work with teachers in Indiana, and the program officer kind of alluded to the fact that if I was working with supporting the training of coaches instead of just teachers, that it probably would be um, more better received. And I figured, well, that's a part of what I was trying to do. And so I just finished up a grant um, working with trying to support uh, mathematics coaches across three school districts in Indiana in June. So that has been particularly fun and interesting. I'm Jane Mahan, and I am a district lead coach for the Evansville Vandenberg School Corporation, which for those of you not from Indiana, it's, uh, we're on the southern tip of Indiana. And I am wanting to move to one of those blue states um, <laughs> because um, I've not been formally trained, but um, through my um, 
years of experience in the math classroom and the training that I have been given by my district, I am a, um, I'm titled an academic coach, so I would really love to say that I'm a true mathematics coach, but I'm not. I have to dabble in reading. Um, I fake my way through that, um, but my passion is in, in mathematics. So you've already answered this question a little bit, but if you could describe each of you a little bit more about the experiences you've had with um, mathematics specialist research and or experiences with practice and how the research has informed your practice. So I just um, finished a two-year grant where I was working with um, elementary math specialists who were in that first category, they're mathematics teachers. As a part of that grant, they each received um, the elementary math specialist endorsement from the state of Kentucky. And then we are conducting research to look at the student achievement from the students in those teachers' classrooms as compared to the students in the teachers' classrooms who were not part of the grant and don't have that endorsement. So that's the research piece that I just finished a few days ago. Um, and then I alluded to this earlier, but the practice piece for me is I do lots of professional development with coaches. And I think, uh, was the second, the last question, the connection between those two? How, yeah, how, how has the research informed your practice? Yeah, so um, the one way that the research has really informed my practice is on this issue of training and ongoing support. Um, we know from research that coaches need to have ad adequate training and professional development. And so I am constantly advocating for that. When I work with districts, um, I talk to the administrators about that. Um, usually part of the reason they brought me there is for training. So it gives me an in to talk about how this is important and to talk about what other training they might need. So in June, I finished up a two-year project. It started with 23 teachers who were identified by their principals to be a part of the program. So they, like, they coined a phrase called, they were voluntold, <laughs> um, that they had to be a part of um, this project. Uh, 23 stayed in the program for a year, um, and then they decided they didn't want to really be leaders in their schools, and they were given the option by their district to not continue. And so we went down to 15. And from six teachers from one school, because uh, essentially what we're doing, we're creating leaders at the grade level. They got a new principal, and she decided she could not have her teachers out of the building um, for a day a month, so they could not continue in the program even. Let's just stop there. So we ended up with uh, starting with 23 and ended up with seven. Um, because two of the nine who were left were then asked to leave their schools. So here I am, one year later, we have seven teachers, which actually turned out to be, um, provided opportunity that I, we couldn't have had as a team if we had 23, which was to actually coach and be a coach to understand the experience in supporting teachers to be coaches. Um, and some of the work that I pulled from, and it comes from this notion, and you mentioned it, the idea of differentiated professional development. So we all know this in terms of how we work with students, that our students are different. They come to our classrooms and to the learning space with different backgrounds, different levels of knowledge, and we don't necessarily, or we're not, we shouldn't treat them all the same, but oftentimes when we work with groups of teachers, we kind of see them as this one collective, all the same, and we treat them the same. Um, and so this gave me an opportunity to try out something that I've been wanting to do, which is to actually treat teachers as individuals in the professional development space. So I pulled from the literature that we know about what supports really good professional development, but I also pulled from research in the edge psych literature about some of the constructs that in influence decision making in the classroom and how teachers decide to engage with students. So this teaching efficacy literature, the emotions literature, the grit literature, the growth mindset literature. I also kind of look at um, some of the literature in um, therapeutic space, like how do we interact and engage meaningfully with people when we're dealing with the psychology of what they're going on with. Um, 
And so get seven teachers and a team of five, we could do that. So we went through what we called um, individualized coaching cycles with seven of the teachers. We were able to do five of them. Um, and what that entailed was having an extensive discussion initially about their history of working with a particular mathematical idea um, and then trying to support the teacher um, in being able to teach that mathematical idea well um, and then going into the classroom with the teacher to support the teacher. So that less directive kind of coaching. Um, so we didn't co-teach with the teacher. It was her or his classroom and we were there to kind of provide support in more of kind of a football coach kind of way on the sidelines and we you know, would tag and kind of provide some input and provide feedback in areas where the teacher couldn't actually see. Then we would, it was all video recorded. The teacher would watch the video, we would watch the video and then we would have what we refer to as a post-coaching conversation afterwards where the teacher would bring from what she had viewed or he had viewed from the video interesting pieces of classroom events that they wanted to discuss and then we'd engage and talk about that. An important part of the conversations that I thought was having them unpack how they felt through the entire experience and what was going on. So when we suggested that they modify a lesson that they wanted to teach in particular ways and it were just suggestions, they could always refuse, how did you feel in, as you went through that? What were some of the things that went through your mind? Um, when we were in your classroom, what kinds of emotions did you feel? Why and where were those coming from? And a part of doing that was to help them to understand what they need to understand as they're working with teachers. That it, when you impose your perspective on someone else, sometimes the reason they don't take it up is because they don't necessarily see that it's a valuable idea, but you're challenging something about how they know what who they are as teachers and professionals and people, and understanding that larger psychological terrain is useful for productive work. Um, so that was particularly challenging initially with the teachers because you're saying, lay yourself bare to me, um, you know, and tell me all of that stuff. Um, and we went through five of these with each of the teachers, and so that's kind of what we finished up in June. Wow, ditto. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm not involved in that way, in that, in that aspect, as these two ladies are. But um, I will just talk about my practice a little bit. Um, this is my ninth year of coaching, and I've actually had better situations as far as coaching is concerned. Um, in the past, I, I was at a school where there was some of that voluntold going on. Uh, but um, it had a huge impact on teachers and their practice, uh, which they didn't really care for at first but um, really came to see the need for it. Um, so we did a lot of, every week um, I was in their classrooms, I had a group of teachers that I was responsible for, and so uh, we would have what we called cluster meetings, and um, we would, uh, I would do some field testing, um, and then I'd bring that back. Um, if it didn't work, I threw that out, and I would do something else, and we would um, get that to a point where we felt like it was in a good place, and uh, we'd share that out in clusters. And then we each week with my group of teachers, I would go to their classrooms and I would observe, co-teach, or model for them. And then we would, um, we would pre-conference and post-conference um, as well. Um, and that was a great thing, but then the funding ran out. So um, now, unfortunately, in my role, um, yeah, it, it seems to come down to money a lot in our district. and. Um, but the, um, the role I'm in right now, I have, I'm actually, my title's a district lead coach. We have five pub public high schools, and so we have five attendance districts, and I'm working with one of them, and I work with the schools, elementary and middle schools, that are non-title, because the title schools have their own coaches in the buildings. And um, so I'm, I really feel like I'm more of an, a consultant th than a coach. So I feel like I'm stepping backwards, but I think we're moving in the right direction. Um, I've heard through the uh, grapevine that we might be having literacy and math coaches in the near future, so that probably will be after I've retired, but um, that's okay. So, um, but I still get to work with teachers and I still work to, uh, get to work with students. I get to go into classrooms and model occasionally, but more, more of it is spending time in PLCs and working with groups of teachers. Um, so you, you've described your work as 
um, in research and in practice. So if each of you could just kind of describe some of the challenges that you've faced. And you mentioned some, but maybe like pick one that you think is worthy of, of our attention today. I don't have to always start. <laughs> Yeah, we can. Okay. Let's, we could. Yeah, let's I don't have to start hand. every time. What are you all go ahead. <laughs> so I think for me, one of the challenges, are, and I work with a team of students. They're around here somewhere. Um, is trying to figure out for that specific teacher what are the barriers to kind of taking up um, the task that is ahead of them, and I think oftentimes in the literature it's just positioned as lack of knowledge or lack of experience. Um, but when you work with a teacher who understands the math really well, um, has quite a bit of experience, um, but is still in some ways struggling to enact practices in ways that are going to be useful for the students that they're teaching, but also in the next role that their principal wants them to take up, what's that barrier? Because I've tested your knowledge. I've seen you in classrooms. That's not the issue. Um, what, what else is going on and, and how can I pinpoint it? And it's oftentimes not one thing. Um, we have one interesting teacher in our group who um, has scored like 90, over 90%, 90th percentile in almost every math assessment, um, but is struggling with the belief that he can actually be a good teacher and it, therefore how can he then support other teachers? And until we were able to get at that, it was like hitting a wall um, in terms of you have the knowledge, you're actually very thoughtful and reflective about your practice, what's going on? But it was, I don't really believe I can do this. I really don't. I know other people can do it, I've seen it. I know what good practices are. I can talk about them in depth and I can identify it when I see it, but I just don't think I can. Um, and so it was a shift in well, to get this teacher there, I need to engage him in mastery experiences and what the literature talks about in how to support and build teacher e efficacy. That the knowledge wasn't the issue and the understanding of what our high leverage practices wasn't the issue. It was the fact that when you don't believe you can do something, it's a barrier for you actually enacting that. So that's been particularly challenging, figuring out what those barriers are for each of the teachers that um, I'm working with to get them to that place where they can feel confident about supporting others. Um, I, would th I would say, remember I said just a few minutes ago that I work with non-title schools. Um, our title schools have tons and tons of support and they're used to uh, many, many people in and out. They have a revolving door and in and out. And so in the non-title schools, um, the teachers um, are very defensive when others come into their classroom and don't particularly want that extra support. Um, so it's um, trying to fight that fixed mindset and trying to help them develop a growth mindset that we're all here to learn. Um, this is my 35th year in education and I've been a coach for nine. Um, and it's just that I grow and I learn every day and uh, trying to get them to, to see that because many of them, just because they think they've been teaching 20 plus years, that they're an expert and they don't need that support. So it's really difficult working with um, some of them to get, just to see that I'm here to support you, I'm not evaluating you, I want to be of support to you and your students. So, so a, a challenge for me and others who do research in this area um, is really being able to definitively make the connection between mathematics coaching and student achievement um, to the level that some people want it to be made. Um, there are so many factors that influence student achievement. It's really hard to say that having a math coach is the one thing that made the difference. Um, so Pat Campbell's one person that you know has done that using HLM, um, but there are people in the field that don't agree with that method and don't think that that method really shows that. So even within the field, we have disagreement about how do we really make that connection. It's a huge challenge that we're still trying to figure out. How can we say it was the coach 
that made the difference. So this is something, um, as the field, we're going to continue to struggle with and um, figure out um, what that really means. Um, I'm going to toss in a question here that I didn't include <laughs> in my list. Great. <laughs> Thanks, Sharon. <Sarah. laughs> but I'm just realizing what, Maggie, you were just saying. Um, like, if you were trying to convince a school district that this would be a good idea to try, or, or a principal, that you, you might want to have that kind of information. So it's making me um, think about the issue that I'm particularly interested in right now, is that's the relationship between administration or principals and the coaches or the specialists. Could, could you talk a little bit about things that you've observed or research that you've seen or in, been a part of that involves the relationship between principals and coaches. So there's not a lot out there. Okay. The working group was talking a little bit about this today um, because there's not a lot of research out there about that. Um, Lindsay Gibbons has written some about it, but um, there's just not a lot out there right now. I think most of what we know about that is going to come from those in the field who have those experiences because there's just very little research on it. Again, another area where we need research. I think, I'm not sure this is, this is not gonna directly answer your question, but um, because I don't necessarily interact with principals a okay. lot in my work, mm -hmm. I just get the feedback from the teachers that it's a struggle to work with their principals. Uh, but we have a program that I've been involved in where we bring school teams to Indiana University. And I teach a module in that program and school teams comprised of the superintendent, the principal at a particular school and then other leaders in the school. And I use that as an opportunity to provide a vision of mathematics that I think a lot of the individuals in the room um, are not really exposed to. And I, through that module, I try to get to sensitize the principals and the superintendents, those who really make decisions about what happens in mathematics classrooms at the end of the day, um, about what kind of support um, teachers need in order to teach in the way that we're advocating. So I kind of get them to buy into the model first um, and say, is this the kind of teaching that you would want to see going on in your classroom? And this is built out of or comes from or drawn from a view of mathematics as such. Mm -hmm. And over a couple of hours, they start to think, wow, this is really engaging, this is really meaningful. I would want the students at my school to be engaged in this. And then we unpack, well, what do you think it requires of a teacher to be able to engage students in this way? And you know, they draw on a lot of knowledge about math and <laughs> so on and so forth. And we do get into the conversation of, well, they do have four core subjects to teach and sometimes specials, depending on where they are. And well, how do we get teachers there? Do you think all the teachers in your building are at that space, in that place usually? No, how do we get them there? Um, and who in your building can provide the support? Are you able to provide the support? And most of them, they, they're, no, they can't. <laughs> and I said, well, do you have uh, an assistant administrator who can do that? No, they don't. Um, do you have a lead teacher at each grade level who does that? No, they don't. And so they get to the point where they recognize, wow, my teachers are in the space where that they're in, and there's no one to provide that support. And we talk about that, that support is very different from going in and doing a 20-minute evaluation, however often you do it. Um, and the feedback that is being provided through those evaluations is not really supportive of practice. It's usually supportive of better classroom management. Um, and, and that's kind of where I try to get an entry point to principals. Uh, usually often after the module, I get an opportunity to follow up and work with them in a different capacity. Um, but, you, but the principals who I work with are not connected to the teachers that I work with okay. in that way. So, um, but. I think that's probably where we need to, to go. We started talking today about um, the idea that a coach in a building not only has to think about the teachers in terms of coaching, but you also in some ways have to coach the principal as well to get on the same page with you about what constitutes effective mathematics teaching in a classroom and how that might be very different from the model and the structure that they now have in place. 
Um, I have a great relationship with the principals I work with, uh, mainly for the reason you were just talking about, Dion, is that they're, they don't have anyone else um, to, to do that work. And so um, I get lots of requests to work with teachers after they've been evaluated, unfortunately, to um, help them with best practices. Um, and it really takes a load off of their plate. So um, I'm not... I'm not administrative and I'm not a teacher, I'm kind of in between. Um, so I do support principals that way um, a lot. Um, unfortunately, sometimes I'm doing things for principals that's not always, a, I shouldn't say it's not a part of my role. I think it is expected of me to do that, but it's not always um, with the coaching. Um, I wanna talk about this gap this between the or the gap or the intersection between theory and practice re research and practice so um, cuz Maggie had some suggestions what what kind of gaps are we trying to address in that in that intersection and and what can and what can we do to promote a better intersection for me i think one of the gaps um you know, we have lots of districts now that have coaches, right? It's kind of like people are jumping on the bandwagon. You know, coaching seems like a good thing. Let's do it. Um, and they're creating programs in districts, but they're not aware of the research. And so they're not aware of the fact that their coaches need training and their coaches need to be prepared and so for me, one of the gaps we've got to fill up is we've got to form partnerships so that people in the districts are aware of the research. That's where something like the research brief can be a great advocacy tool to make them aware of what the research says and let's build coaching programs based on, even though it's a little, it's more, you know, it's something. Let's build programs actually based on what the research says. I think a part of it is also, hopefully, the research community and the practitioner community, those who do a lot of the actual work, um, I think there's some agreement that it takes a lot of time and investment. Um, but then also, for those who are at research institutions, we also need the people who evaluate us to understand that this is important work and that it's so you get in that sticky area where you, it, to get to the research to publish, you need to invest a lot of time and work in the field. Um, and if a lot of if researchers don't feel like that work was going to be valued at their institution, it's, it's discouraging to actually engage in that work. So this entire year has, uh, if I added up the hours, it probably would be probably over 100 hours working with seven teachers over the course of a year. At the end of the year, I would say six of the seven were better teachers, but not ready to be coaches. Um, so that's also something that you alluded to, that when principals identify teachers as good teachers, sometimes they have a different set of metrics to use that we would probably have a different way of viewing it as educators. And so we value the fact that they're probably the better teachers in the school, but we recognize that there is some work that needs to be done, sometimes quite a bit of work, to get them to the point where they are those good teachers, and then to the next level where they are the teacher leaders we need them to be to support teachers effectively. Um, and that, that's a long road. It's a lot of time investment that sometimes schools are not willing to give. It requires at least time for teachers. It also requires incentives for teachers, and then the credentialing. It's, I'm gonna go through two years of all of this work, and then what's, what is it gonna, what, what's my reward at the end of it? And yes, you could go through, well, it's for the children, but then, you know, it is for the children, but you know, you gotta keep it real. Um, what is the outcome at the end of the two years if there's no advanced credential? Um, also, you have to think about, you have to have, come to teachers with some amount of legitimacy if you are going to position yourself as a leader in that environment. It can't just be the principal decided that you should be here. Um, I think the credentialing process not only is a, it, a, it not only gets them to have the skills to do well, 
it does give them that legit legitimacy they need to actually go into schools and work with teachers um, and gets rid of some of that. There's gonna be some resistance, but less resistance as they, as they do that. So I think understanding the time it takes to develop that expertise, having investment on, from all the stakeholders in the process to, to, to invest in this work, and then having a system of rewards for those who are invested in, in this work, I think it's gonna be important. I would certainly agree with both of you ladies uh, in, in that regard about the training. We have, um, because Indiana does not have that um, endorsement um, out there, that we are just literally plucking teachers from the classroom to be coaches, and then we try and give them uh, the training. So um, I'd certainly agree that um, that is um, a real gap. Um, and hopefully, I'm wishing, hoping that this can come about so that um, we're not, we aren't just taking the best teachers, oh, you're a good teacher, so we're gonna plop you um, in this position. We have, our district has um, a lot of coaches. We have e-learning coaches, we have data coaches, and then we have uh, district coaches. Uh, we're considered the instructional coaches. And um, we have just all really been plucked <laughs> from um, our positions based on um, our areas of expertise, um, mainly, um, you know, from what I shared with them, how great I was so that they would give me that job. <laughs> so, um, but um, really, you know, that's kind of the way it's working right now. So um, it, would, it would be great to, to be able to fill that gap and, and have um, a, a specialist um, at a university who could actually do that work with fidelity. We want to open up the floor for questions and comments, but first, yeah, yes, we're gonna give a Maggie's gonna give away a book. Sorry, I got ahead of you, No, you're good. So um, this is gonna be interesting because we have a lot of empty chairs. Your mic. This is gonna be interesting because we had a lot of empty chairs. Rebecca put some. Um, blue colored shapes on the bottom of some of the chairs. And we are looking for a blue circle. Look. Come on. Blue circle. We need some music, some, some searching music. <laughs> or some Jeopardy music. <laughs> Only I was a singer. We're looking for a blue circle. This has become a treasure hunt. Turn those chairs over. A blue circle. Maybe we should take the first one we find. For an, first anything. Yay. There's the blue circle. Come on down. <laughs> I didn't make it. It's, okay, it's an oval. Yes. It's a blue oval. Yes. There's the music after we found it. <laughs> there we go, the Jeopardy music, thank you. Here, yeah, we've got a couple of people here with uh, Rebecca and Andrew have microphones, so if anyone has a question for the panel, or a particular person on the panel, please. Um, so one of the challenges I've seen in, um, in work I've been involved in is as more districts are picking up coaches, they're also uh, putting the initiative back down again without giving it a lot of time to really take hold, especially in contexts where we have grant funding to support the coaches for the duration of the grant. And then when the funding goes away or the incentive goes away, the districts move away from the model or really reduce the number of coaches to the point that it's not effective anymore. So I'm wondering what we need to do as we develop grants and think about new initiatives um, to better support districts in sustaining their investment in coaches. I wish I had the answer to that question. That is the million dollar question. Anybody who writes a grant, right? 
because we see this over and over and over. And I honestly, um, I don't have a good answer for that. I hope somebody else on the panel or in the room does. So I don't have a, an answer that I think would work in general. Um, there's one school district that I worked with for, how long, Rick, seven years, I think? Yeah, about seven years. Um, and it started without any money. So it was one school um, and built a relationship with the principal to the point where I could get the teachers to do almost anything, which was great. Um, and then when we got more money, we were able to get other schools involved. Um, and then we got more money and then we were able to keep the same schools and expand. So that doesn't always happen because you're not guaranteed funding year after year or each, each cycle. But I was fortunate enough to get funding or have funding for five of the seven years that I worked with the school. And that ended about a year ago, but the teachers still email. I'm pretty confident that if I went there next year and I had funding again, they would be on board. Um, so I think it's, it's one, things that we talk to coaches about, building trust and rapport, not only with the teachers, but as much with the administration, um, helping them to understand the, the longevity of the work that's being done. Include the administrators as much as, as you can. Um, with that particular grant, it, was, it wasn't very difficult to include some of the administrators. Some administrators, it's just the lost cause. You're just not gonna get them on board. But when the, the teachers really, they see the changes in their practices over time, they recognize that you're invested in their growth, even sometimes more than they are. Um, you'll develop that core set of teachers who you can have some amount of confidence that they're gonna continue to work and improve even after you've left. Um, create lines of communication that they can use outside of the grant um, and encourage and, and strengthen those over time. I don't, I, I think even after five years, there were teachers who were probably too Rick who were pretty confident, were really, really good, um, and just stellar. And there were probably another 10 who were really almost close, um, but the, the money ran out. And, but it's through developing those strong lines of communication and trust and a relationship that I've been able to still communicate with them and have been able to send other people there, like literacy grants and leadership funding, and they've benefited, you know, for, in other ways outside of from that relationship. So it, it's not a foolproof method, but it's something that has potential. I, I will share one strategy I used in the grant I just finished, and I know Nicole used the same strategy in a grant she's working on, is um, we decided to use lesson study as one of the professional development activities. And so in my grant, they actually did lesson study with other coaches in the room. And then in the second year, they went into their schools and did lesson studies in their schools. And it was the one thing in exit interviews that coaches said to me, this is something I can do next year when you're not here. So although it's not going to guarantee um, that everything in the program continues, that was one structure that they said, this is something I can do. You know? So maybe there are pieces like that that we can focus on that they feel like it's something they can continue when we're not there. I'm Betsy. I'm Betsy Berry, and I um, am here in Indiana and one of those committee members. And one of the things that I, re I so often, it is about grant money and about administration, but one of the words we haven't yet talked about in this room is political will. Um, we mentioned it briefly about creating an endorsement and certification and that sort of thing. But um, I once saw a t-shirt in a Sky Mall magazine that said, those who can teach and those who can't make laws about teaching. Um, I know that makes us smile, but the, the thing is that we do need political will, not just for endorsements and and certifications, but also for the understanding that this role in a school is an absolutely crucial one if we do want to turn around those 
national statistics about STEM fields and so on. Amen. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, there you are. Um, so I'm wondering about kind of the international, um, if there's any kind of leverage that can be gained from international, this kind of continuing economic competition with other places. And we know a lot of the high achieving countries, actually some of those countries have meth specialists. That's their standard practice. And I just wonder if there's any leverage to be gained from this constant talking about economic competition um, to use some of those other countries as models and maybe Cheryl shaking dry, she's nodding her head like, yeah, we've done that. So, <laughs> yeah, I was, so I just wonder, you know, if, if, that, if there's anything there, I guess. Cheryl, go. Uh, yes, our representative Baining here in Indiana, who is the chair of the Indiana House Education Committee is very much um, paying attention to those studies. And Doris noticed that and said, we need to talk to this guy. And I didn't want to talk to him, but she made us. And that was, but that was our connection. That's how we got into his door. And we handed him a copy of the NCTM Elementary Math Specialist Handbook and said, would you read this if we gave it to you? And he took it. And, and the next thing we knew, he was calling Skip Fennell to find out some information about um, CAPE and the CAPE standards for elementary math specialists. And he had, he, Baining convened a group of superintendents and had Skip Fennell talk to them and then Baining invited us back to talk to a group of principals. So we have no idea where, if this will go anywhere, but we were using that kind of leverage to, awesome. to have a conversation. Yes, that's right. Yep, Baining did, yep. Some bit, thank you. <laughs> so that group that he's a part of, they visited some of those high-performing countries to see what they do differently, and they put out a report, and that's what caught my eye. And um, when I said to Cheryl, we need to talk to this man because he seems to care that we're not keeping up with the Joneses. Um, but... <laughs> Yeah. Um, we need people maybe in this room running for office. That's what we need. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I have a dissertation. Right. <laughs> so I, I thought that Maggie, one of the, the comments you made during the, the presentation was what, what's the knowledge that coaches need? And I think that's a, a question that needs a lot of, of work. And I'd love to hear from the panel, what's, what's different be, besides what a teacher needs versus a teacher leader or math specialist? So in the AMTE standards, um, those first two bullets were really about content knowledge. Of course, we want coaches to have content knowledge. The second bullet was really about pedagogical knowledge. Of course, we want them to have pedagogical knowledge. But that third one, was leadership skills and knowledge, and that's really comprehensive. And it includes things like understanding adult learning theory. Just, and it goes back to just because you were a good math teacher does not mean you're gonna be a good math coach. Working with adults is very different than working with students. And so one piece I think that we really need to focus on is that adult learning theory and what that means to a math coach. We just assume that if they can work with kids, they can work with adults. And that's just not true. And then this whole idea about how to build relationships um, and just communication skills. I mean, and these are things that um, are not necessarily content specific to mathematics, right? These are the pieces of what does it mean to coach? Not that the mathematics piece isn't important, it's critically important. But we've got three categories in that document, two of them focus on mathematics and that third one focuses on the leadership piece, how to communicate with people, how to work with adults, how to build relationships, because those are critically important. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but somebody else give it a go. <laughs> I'm going to piggyback on what you said and, and draw on my own experience over the past year serving as a coach for adults. Um, and there, 
these moments when you know a teacher will say to you or imply that oh no that's not going to work and it, you have to take a moment and did you just tell me what I said was not a good idea <laughs> yeah. um, and and pause and recognize that the correct approach would be okay well let's talk a little bit about that and not well I know what I'm talking about um, and and recognize that in a classroom oftentimes there aren't these negotiations that you have to have with students you can orchestrate that conversation and you know deal with that in a very different way but with an adult that you're really trying to build that trust and rapport um, that you have to navigate that differently that their listening skills that you have to develop um, in terms of hearing, and you have to do this too with kids, but in a different way with adults, mm -hmm. to hear what they're not saying. Um, it's, students would more readily say, I don't know, I don't understand, I don't get it. Um, teachers will not, for the most part, lay themselves bare to you and say, you know what, I've never really understood this fraction multiplication thing. <laughs> Help me. Um, they're just not going to do it. Um, so you have to, in the conversation, and you, and, you, and you can't delicately say, you don't know what you're talking about, just listen to me. You really have to figure out what is the best entry point for you to support that teacher in recognizing um, that it's okay to, to identify where you need support and allow me to help you to get there. Um, sometimes they don't even recognize that they need that help. Um, and you have to figure out a pathway to get them to that point. And also, I'm also and that's where I talk about I'm dealing in a space where I'm also thinking, I want you to recognize that you need support, but I don't want to damage your teacher efficacy. And I don't want to create a highly, a space that is highly emotionally charged that you can't function effectively again. So how do I navigate this this engagement with teachers um, who are professionals, who have this experience and confidence, um, or those who don't, um, in a way that's going to make them really strong leaders and um, supportive of the teachers that they're going to work with. And I don't think that those are skills that we even talk about a lot as teacher educators. Um, in terms of working with pre-service teachers and in-service teachers in the capacity. Um, and so how do we develop those skills? I kind of tried along the way, um, and it was a lot of talking to my, because I'm not a therapist and I'm not a counselor, and, um, and sometimes my efficacy is challenged um, in those mm. conversations as well um, when a teacher is pushing back and you know the lesson didn't go well. Um, and they're pushing back on what you think you know about what should be happening and to be able to swallow that pride and recognize that the positive outcome that you want has to be um, traveled and you navigate the path very differently than you would with a student. Hi, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Hudson and Dr. Moore, I'd like to recognize them uh, from the University of Southern Indiana. I've worked with them many years and I've grown so much from just their help and support over the years and I really value their friendship. Um, I've also had the opportunity to work with Courtney Flessner and her husband, so a shout out to them as well. Um, so I'm continuing to grow in uh, my profession because of all of those people. So um, I will say though, um, I actually, um, when our district uh, started um, a coaching model, um, I always knew, I was in the classroom 25 years and I always knew there was something more out there for me and I always um, had an idea of maybe working um, maybe as a mathematics supervisor in our district, um, uh, doing something a little bit different outside the classroom. So I actually went um, to school and did go to the University of Southern Indiana to get my um, administrative license and um, my husband kept asking me, now why are you doing this? Because I told him it wasn't to be a principal. I had no desire to be a principal, but I was taking those courses um, for the leadership um, that it would offer me as um, maybe possibly a coach or a supervisor someday. And um, it's just kind of like you're, 
um, student teaching, nothing really ever pre truly prepares you for what you're <laughs> going to encounter out there in the real world. And um, I spent the first year, year and a half, just building relationships with teachers. Um, because remember those non-title schools I talked about? Um, it was difficult to even get my foot in the door. And it was almost like, oh, can I make those copies for you? And I had people saying, why are you making copies? You're a coach. And I said, um, you don't understand. <laughs> um, so it took a long time to build that trust in those relationships with teachers. And I spent a long time doing that. And I'm so glad I did because after, um, I'm, this is the fifth year in my current role as a district leader. And um, it has, there were teachers that didn't, wouldn't even talk to me for the first two or three years, just had no use for me whatsoever. So I'd always been told, don't water the weeds. So um, I think that um, in seeing what their teammates uh, were doing and some of the things that I was helping them do in their classroom, they kind of came around to that idea and then slowly let me into their um, classroom and started letting me have conversations with them. Um, but um, yeah, it, it, is, it is interesting in dealing with adults a whole lot different than dealing with students, and, but very time well spent building those relationships. I would like to thank our panelists, Maggie, Dion, and Jane, and thank all of you for being here this afternoon and enjoy the rest of the conference.